Major balk for Major League Baseball. Yes, Major League Baseball officially announcing that the first games are going to be canceled here. That's right. Baseball has been canceled. Could be for just a few games or could be for the entire 2022 season. I don't know. But first off, my name is James Lee. Welcome to my channel 5149, where I talk business, politics, society. And today I want to talk about the 2022 MLB lockout. Yes, I know that there are a lot of other things going on out there in the world. And some people are going to characterize this as a petty disagreement between millionaires and billionaires. This is one tweet. Feel bad for baseball fans. I don't feel sorry for the billionaires who are fighting with the millionaires. But I think there's a little bit more to it than that. I think it's a story of workers versus owners. It's also a story of capital versus labor. The stuff we talk about on this channel all the time. The interactions, the dynamics, the power struggle, the history between the two opposing groups in baseball, something that we should all pay close attention to because I think there, there's a lot that can be learned from as it relates to worker exploitation and the ongoing tug of war between corporate power and workers' rights. A couple things about the 2022 MLB lockout that I wanna clear up right away though, most MLB players are not millionaires. There are of course millionaire baseball players involved on the player side, but there are also players like San Diego Padres prospect Steven Wilson, he wrote on Twitter, I signed for $5,000 in 2018, made $10,000 in 2019, less in 2020, and about $18,000 in AAA in 2021. Got added to the 40-man uh, roster this season, so I am currently locked out. Been driving Uber since January, so I have money until baseball starts. A lot of us actually need it. I think many people forget about the long tail of young players who haven't made it big time. The second thing I want to clear up is that this work stoppage is not a strike, it's a lockout. Tensions between players and the commissioner and owners hasn't been this bad since 1994, which resulted in one of the biggest disasters in MLB history. And today, the two sides are arguing over the exact same thing the CBA, which is essentially an agreement that determines the rules and finances of baseball. This agreement expires around every five years. In a recent history, this wasn't a big deal because the two sides agreed to a new CBA before the old one expires. But when they can't, three things can happen. The owners can do what they're doing now. They can lock out the players, refusing to let them play or get paid until they agree to a new CBA. Owners can also agree to temporarily use the old CBA and games go on as normal. Or owners agree to temporarily use the old CBA and players go on strike, refusing to play until a new agreement is reached. And you see that there were and still are other options out there and the lockout is a choice, a concoction of Rob Manfred, the commissioner of the MLB along with the owners, purely a strategic negotiation tactic to try and get an upper hand on the players. I'm about to read a little bit from an article written by sports journalist Alex Kirshner. Such obfuscation is part of the plan. Manfred and the owners did not show up to this self-created crisis without a strategy. The commissioner has spent most of his whole professional life as a management side labor lawyer, helping companies fight unions. That experience is why the owners picked him to succeed Bud Selig in 2014. His career has built toward this moment of hardball with baseball's best players. Okay, I think the story is starting to take shape here, right? It's capital versus labor. And let's put aside the dollars and cents for one second and think in terms of value. The key question we can all kind of ponder, should the players who for all intents and purposes are responsible for the on-field entertainment value they provide to the fans control more of that overall value? Which brings us to taking a bit of a journey back in time today to over 130 years ago when baseball players revolted against the owners and started their own league aptly titled the Players League. The year was 1889. Baseball was the most popular sport in America, with the most popular league being the National League, which was formed back in 1876. The players were making middle-class salaries for the most part, with some making quite a bit more. In 1889, there was a salary cap of $2,500, about $75,000 in today's money. So they were making a living but weren't wealthy by any standard. The National League's profitability in the 1880s was enabled by two things. One, they created territorial monopolies around each city where there was a team. For example, they were the only league that could have a baseball team in Chicago or Philadelphia. That cut down any competition. 
Then they had the reserve rule, which was gradually rolled out across the 1880s, which meant that players were bound to a team for life unless they were sold by that team. Players couldn't negotiate for a better contract. They had no mobility. Once you were, say, signed by the New York Giants, you were a New York Giant and had no control over that. In 1885, the players had organized their first union called the Brotherhood of Professional Baseball Players, but the National League refused to recognize them and refused to meet with them. Then in 1889, John Brush, the owner of the National League Club in Indianapolis, developed a new scheme where every player would be graded A through E not just by their play, but on their character and off the field habits. So if they were going out to saloons or in the press because they got in a fight, that could put them in a lower class. Their class would determine how much money they would make and the maximum was gonna be $2,500. Everything came to a head. The brush classification scheme, the salary cap, the buying and selling of players, the fact that the league was not going to meet with the union, and the fact that players knew that they were the reason the leagues were so profitable led the players to say, screw it, we're gonna form our own league. They created eight new teams in the offseason with investors who seemed sympathetic to the players' cause. Players could be part owners of the club. They built new ballparks that were nicer than the National League ballparks by all accounts. The Players League actually built the Polo Grounds, the legendary Manhattan ballpark where Willie Mays would play years later. According to baseball historians, about 85% of the National League players from 1889 ended up playing in the Players League in 1890. There was a great pennant race between Boston and Chicago. There was the first ever no-hitter in which the team who threw the no-hitter lost the game. There was great hitting, great defense. By the end of the year, the players were celebrating and not just Boston who ended up winning the championship, but by all accounts, the league, the Players League, was drawing more fans than the National League. All right, so you're probably wondering to yourself, if it was so successful, whatever happened to the Players League? How come most of us have never heard of it? Well, according to Robert Ross, who wrote the book, The Great Baseball Revolt, The Rise and Fall of the 1890 Players League, quote, behind their backs, the non-playing investors were colluding with the National League owners and trying to find a way to consolidate ownership of the clubs. There were even a couple player spies who were feeding the National League owners with information. These investors who had pledged their economic and ideological support joined forces with the National League and essentially said, we want to make more money. They wanted to go back to a monopoly system where there was only one league operating in each city. It was a big betrayal. The league was really taken down by greedy investors who wanted to make more money. Most of the investors were real estate investors or connected to railway lines. It was in their best interest to build ballparks strategically. They build them at the edge of a city and that could justify a railway line being built there or people buying property around the ballparks. So the investors had an interest in making money off baseball, but also using baseball to grow their other businesses. Mm, damn, the cruel realities of capitalism rearing its ugly head again. They, they were so close, uh, right? Not only were these players able to organize a brand new league in a short amount of time, it was actually successful. And we all know how hard it is to start a new professional sports league. Best of luck to the USFL. Anyway, I think there's a warning to be heeded. Robert Ross was asked what impact the Players League had on the owners and players and on labor relations of the two sides going forward. He said, Quote, my impression based on the testimony of players is that it was exhausting to create the Players League and demoralizing to see it fall apart. No one wanted to go through all that again because it was such an expenditure of energy and money. I think that explains why players from that generation didn't attempt it again. Beyond that generation, the Players League was really written out of baseball history. That is heartbreaking. And, and just so everybody knows, the reserve clause that gave teams unilateral control over the livelihoods of players was not abolished until 1975, 85 years after the dissolution of the Players League. And I think this is where I wanna draw what I think is an important parallel between what happened to the Players League, um, to the renewed strength that we're witnessing in labor all over America, the likes of which we haven't seen in many, many decades. 2021 was dubbed the, quote, year of the worker and saw over 3 million strike days with 140,000 participants, right? There's no way we can talk about just baseball. We have to talk about the greater labor movement overall. There's the great resignation. There's 
the anti-work movement. There have been major worker strikes at companies like John Deere and Kellogg's, unionization at Starbucks, etc. So we know, we know the pushback from corporate America is going to be brutal. They, they can't afford to let this get out of control. So they have done and will continue to do everything they can to crush and demoralize labor, just as the entrenched establishment National League did to the players uh, over 100 years ago. And if corporate America is successful in doing so, any small minor gains made by labor in the past year could go away for a really, really long time. It's not an accident that Starbucks is deliberately ousting workers who supported unionization using some very questionable tactics. Quote, workers at Starbucks stores in Buffalo are accusing the company of retaliating against union supporters by telling them uh, that they have to leave the company if they cannot increase their work availability. Hey, Bob, you voted for the union, right? Yeah, oh, okay, great. Um, by the way, are you, you willing to work tomorrow? I know it's not on your schedule, but if you can, that'd be great. No? Okay, you're fired. For the sake of fair reporting, I must also say, quote, the company denies any connection between the scheduling issues and union activities and says the matter is strictly logistical. Starbucks also fired seven workers in Tennessee, but of course, denied that the reasoning was tied to union efforts. Imagine being part of the unionization effort at Starbucks fighting tooth and nail to form the first union only to have it snatched away from you in an instant. It's gotta be extremely devastating feeling thinking that you finally won a small victory to then realize that the game is entirely rigged and winning is near impossible. And it's not just the usual culprits, the villainous companies that we all come to think of, the Walmarts, the Amazons, the McDonald's, because just as in the case of the backstabbing owners who pretended to sympathize with the players in the Players League back in 1890 until it was no longer financially advantageous to do so, I think there also has to be special attention paid to companies who espouse solidarity with the working class but behind the scenes really are just wolves in sheep's clothing. An example, REI, the outdoor equipment and apparel retailer, loves to emphasize the cooperative nature of their business. This is on their website. Quote, an organization owned collectively whose benefits and profits are shared by all the members. Not only is that just untrue, but when a unionization effort pops up, like it has recently in a Manhattan REI store, the company is doing everything possible to undermine and gaslight them. I'm going to read a few uh, excerpts from a union busting email the company's CEO sent to all REI workers in the U.S. Quote, at REI, we anchor everything we do in the co-op way. We support the rights of our employees to speak and act for what they believe, and that includes the current conversation at our Soho store. We always start from a place of respect, which is why I also want to be clear with you about the co-op's position on unionization. We do not believe placing a union between the co-op and its employees is needed or beneficial. I think he really wants us to know that it is a co-op, but you know, in terms of beneficial, from beneficial from whose perspective, we don't like the fact that our workers can collectively come together and bargain for better wages and working conditions. It really messes with our bottom line. So the point I would like to end on and the question I wanna ask everybody is, do you think there is an appropriate balance of power between capital and labor, whether it be the 2022 MLB lockout, the 19 uh, or the 1880 uh, Renegade Players League, or the resurgence in labor we've seen um, in the last 12 months, capital nearly always has the upper hand. So should the goal be for every member of labor to aspire to be part of capital? And if you can't get there, that's too bad. Or should the working class be afforded a baseline level of respect and decency because right now as it stands regardless of how many you know how you want to spin it uh america's guiding principle of profit maximization at all costs can result in nothing other than corporations whether overtly or discreetly doing everything they can to crush and demoralize labor those are my thoughts for the week. I hope you enjoyed this video. I'm very curious to hear uh, your ideas and thoughts. So please share them in the comment section below. Tell me what other topics you'd like for me to explore. Uh, if you enjoyed this video uh, and want to support my work, please take a quick second to hit that like button, share this video with other people, subscribe and hit that notification bell icon so you don't miss any of my future videos. As always, 
Uh, I want to thank you for your time and I'll see you next week. Thank you.